the thing that most surprised me about everything that I've learned in the past few months is that Iranians like really love Israel. <laughs> they really love Israel. They admire Israel. This is Johnny Gould's Jewish State. It's always a pleasure to catch up with Emily Schrader. Back in town with Yosef Haddad, who was on a Whistle Stop UK speaking tour, which included a nasty confrontation with pro intifada students on a variety of campuses. Scroll back an episode for that. An American Israeli journalist and opinion former. Emily is a regular on the Jerusalem Post, the co-host of Headlines with the Haddads, a TV show focused on explaining the Middle East to an American audience and tackling bigotry and misinformation alongside her fiancé. In planning our conversation, we decided this time to take a snapshot of where the Middle East is on Iran. She's in touch with normal Iranian people every day thanks to the marvels of social media. And we unpack what a two-state solution would look like in the era of the Abraham Accords and wave a magic wand over the constitutional crisis drummed up by the Netanyahu government who want to take advantage of Israel's unwritten constitution and plan to make the Knesset superior over the judiciary. A move to greater democracy or an illiberal elite who won't look after Israel's minorities? If this is your first foray into Johnny Gould's Jewish State, join the party. There's a 24-7 live stream of our shows. Just tap this into your browser, jewishstate.radio. That's jewishstate.radio. Radio. Radio. Subscribe to the podcast. Tell your friends. Spool back as far as you want through our episodes. Or how about checking out this one? with the Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem, Fleur Hassan Nahum. In the Arab world, you have to remember, everything is baby steps. So the fact that women can now drive in, in the Saudi, you know, a Westerner hears this and goes, what? This is what you're clinging on to? But it's a step mm-hmm. in a very conservative mm-hmm. country. It's a step towards something else. The fact that Israeli companies are now working in Saudi is a step towards something else. And so we have to... We have to be patient. I think Israelis are very impatient people. Yes. And the Arabs are people who cook slowly. In other words, they need to build trust and they need to get to know you. And and that is a very different way of seeing things and doing things. It's a cultural gap between the West and the Arab world. Emily Schrader, once again, welcome to Johnny Gould's Jewish State. Thank you so much for having me. Happy to be here. Happy to see you. And uh, you're back in London and Yosef is on a tour advocating for the state of Israel, I think, at the business end of the problem in this country, which is our academia. Yeah, there's a huge problem on campuses here. I mean, already we've seen that there's a lot of anti-Israel groups who are complaining and trying to shut down his event which is ironic because his events are calling for peace and dialogue and they're claiming the opposite, but I digress. <laughs> He's amazing, like you, amazingly fervent and strong. And if you want to get into a conversation with him, he will happily take you on. Of course, of course. He's happy to speak literally with anybody. <laughs> Not afraid of any questions. A lot of times he'll have lectures and people will say, is there anything you don't want to talk about? And he's like, no, I'll talk to anyone about anything. I'll answer any questions you have. Indeed. In the last podcast, which was a speech made at the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue in London, at the Q&A, he said, hey, you know, I know you're friends and everything, and I know you're on side, but ask me something that was really going to knock my block off. Yeah. He likes uh, the tough questions. He likes the tough questions. (laughs) He got a couple. Yeah. You know, coexistence. I hate that definition. When it comes to the Israeli society, coexistence between Arabs and Jews. The coexistence is amazing to say it as a definition when it comes to the Israelis and the Palestinians, to the Israelis and the Jordanians, the Egyptians, the Emiratis. But when it comes to the Israeli society, and by the way, it's only my opinion, you can take it or not, the best way to describe it is what I've already told you today, partnership, sharaki. Shutfut. And the best place to see partnership is in the hospitals. 
You would see an Arab doctor treating a Jewish patient. You would see a Jewish doctor treating an Arab pa uh, patient. You would see Arab families and Jewish families together in one room. Yes. So, Emily, it's, it's a pleasure to see you again. And you've been busy on social media as well. And in this incredible third age of digitalization, we can be friends with people thousands of miles away in dictatorships who accidentally allow those people to talk to Jews and Israelis. I'm talking about the Iranian mullahs and their lack of control over social media. Yeah, well, what's interesting about that is that, of course, social media is actually blocked in Iran. And the way that the Iranians have been operating for years now is through satellite TV, which the mullahs can't control, and through VPNs, like the highest level of VPNs. I mean, they could probably train the Israeli Mossad in how to get around internet censorship. So it's a huge problem in Iran, and every time that we've seen uprisings with Iran, we've seen that the regime will shut off, literally shut off all the internet, which of course means for certain periods of time and in certain areas, they don't have internet access either. That's really their only way to actually stop the flow of information. And the Iranians are fed up, you know, they've been living under this dictatorship for 44 years and uh, already, you know, five months running of protests and they're, they're still going, they're still going strong. But yes, what we've seen in the last couple of months is really amazing in terms of their their outreach to Israelis and not you know the government of Israel but individual Israelis they're interacting they're speaking and it's something I never thought I'd see in my lifetime and uh, it's a, I guess a pleasant surprise in a, a very dark situation. Indeed there are grandparents aren't there who ushered in the Iranian revolution got rid of the Shah of Persia a tradition that had gone back thousands of years along with it a Jewish tradition. There are many Jews here who fled in the late 70s. Some were rich there, now they're terribly poor. Some still manage to maintain their wealth here, and many Jews in Los Angeles of Persian extraction, and of course uh, in Israel as well. But the non-Jews of Iran, what do they say to their grandparents, I think it is now, the next generation uh, through them? What do they say to their grandparents about ushering in this revolution? Well, I think, you know, at the time, a lot of people thought that it was maybe a better alternative because there was corruption or because there was some oppression under the Shah of certain groups, primarily Islamists and communists. Um, so anyone who is amongst or allied with those groups has a problem with the Shah. Uh, that kind of remains today even, uh, the attitude about it. However, what we're seeing is that a lot of people who haven't even, you know, lived under the Shah are huge fans of the crown prince, Pahlavi. Um, and the majority of Iranians, a recent poll that was done of Iranians inside Iran, which is notoriously difficult to actually poll, I think they did 150,000, a little over 150,000 Iranians, and 80, more than 80% of them said that they wanted Pahlavi to come back. Now, I actually did an interview with him, with the Crown Prince for Jerusalem Post, and when I spoke to him, he said he doesn't want a monarchy. He, he wants a uh, referendum for the people of Iran to decide what they want moving forward, and personally, he prefers uh, um, a democracy, kind of in the style of the UK. Yes, actually. a constitutional monarchy. Yes. He can be there in the palace, have a veto, have his houses of parliament, but actually not exercise anything more than soft power. Exactly. And of course, what a powerful thing the Shah of Iran would be, the Shah of Persia. Of course. Because of the thousands of years of nearly uninterrupted power that they had. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but unfortunately, the protests, though widespread and huge in number, and we're told that hundreds have been killed or executed by the Shah, Islamic Ayatollah Republic, by the yeah. Islamic regime is not organized enough yeah. to topple the mullahs. Yeah, I mean, for the time being, uh, we're not seeing the momentum that we need to change the regime, but we also have to remember that the Islamic Revolution was 15 months. Mm. So it took quite a while for them to do what they wanted to do back then. Um, and I think that the, the overall hatred of the regime that has oppressed these people for so many years is stronger than the opposition that was uh, to the Shah in 1979. I think this regime will fall. It's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that these protests will continue. One of the other things that's been really effective with it was strikes in certain industries. 
Uh, so the oil industries were striking, oil and gas, uh, sugar, steel, and a lot of these industries are state-run. So these employees who were on strike for a week here, a week here, a week here, uh, they've been fired. Mm. <laughs> the regime even threatened to bring in Chinese workers at one point to replace them. Mm. We're not sure if that was an empty threat or not, but these, these people who are going on strike are literally risking their lives. They're risking their livelihoods. They're risking their lives themselves. Many of them have been arrested. You mentioned that hundreds of people have been killed. I think it's around six, just under 600 people have been killed now, uh, whether executed or shot in the midst of protests. Uh, we know that the crackdowns have been much more violent and harsh in minority areas such as like Kurdish areas of Iran uh, where the regime has been notoriously brutal uh, but I think one of the things that's the most disturbing is that you have over 20,000 people who have been arrested who are sitting in prison now um, and uh, and a lot of them are on you know on death row a lot of them have been sentenced to what they call a uh, corruption on earth which is uh, we don't really know what that means mm -hmm. other than the Ayatollah doesn't like you and what you do um, and people have already begun being executed for that. Uh, so, you know, it remains to be seen. There's a, there's a lot of pressure on the regime, but unfortunately it's not enough uh, from the West and from the rest of the world. So we'll keep uh, keep pushing. Keep pressure on it. And now a weather report, which we always need on the radio, which is that the Iranian people are happy to see you, Emily, you, a Jewish <laughs> Israeli. That's nice. <laughs> it's Yeah, it's, it's definitely a surprise. You know, I've been working to speak to many, many different uh, Iranians on the ground of different backgrounds, uh, Kurdish or Persian, all, all different uh, communities, mostly for, you know, my job as a journalist. I wanted to know what was happening, what they think, what they feel, what they're seeking to do from the beginning. I've I covered Iran for many years. Um, from the human rights perspective. So it's not really unusual that I was talking about it, but obviously the momentum is much different and much more unified across communities, which is something we haven't seen before. You even have religious Iranians who are against this regime. That's never happened before. So the cracks are starting to, you know, things are starting to crumble, but it's just the beginning. And I think it will be a long and difficult fight. But the thing that most surprised me about everything that I've learned in the past few months is that Iranians like really love Israel. <laughs> <laughs> they really love Israel. They admire Israel. Um, and they appreciate that Israel is one of the only countries in the world who has taken a, a very strong stance from day one uh, about this regime, obviously for our own self-interest, but truthfully for the interest of Iranians as well. And so when it comes to the IRGC and the terrorist proxies of the Islamic regime, there's no one that understands what the terrorists are doing better than the people of Iran and the people of Israel. And so in a way, we're sort of in this uh, circle where we really see the truth of, of how evil this regime really is. And a lot of the other world, the rest of the world doesn't quite understand the depravity of what's going on here and how the regime has been active in, in destabilizing pretty much the entire Middle East. You know, Iraq, Yemen, Syria, Lebanon, all of these countries have been impacted by uh, the Iranian regime and its terrorist proxies. I mean, they have IRGC bases in Syria. And I think from the Iranian perspective, when they're looking at what's happening and where their money is going, instead of to the economy of Iran, and this isn't new, this has been happening for decades, their money is going to Syria, to terrorism in Syria. So when they see that Israel and the IDF are the only people who are striking IRGC sites in Syria, they celebrate. Yes. They celebrate. I can't tell you how many people, how many Iranians have messaged me saying every time Israel strikes an IRGC site in Syria, we literally celebrate yes. on social media, in our houses. And, and in fact, when Israel bombed... Um, allegedly bombed the uh, drone facility. Isfahan. Isfahan, right. Uh, people were celebrating. People were celebrating all over social media. Mm. And e even more bizarre, not really related to Israel, but just so you understand how much the people hate this regime, the World Cup. When Iran played against the United States, there were fireworks and parties when in the streets of Iran. When they didn't sing the national anthem. Right. When the Iranian regime lost, when the Iranian team, sorry, lost, the people of Iran celebrated in the streets of Iran that the United <laughs> States won. I was bombarded with messages. Yes, we're so happy. In which case, on behalf of the British people, I've got to apologize for our Welsh boys who lost to Iran. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that went wrong. Uh, anyway. It's um, okay. America clean, came and cleaned up, you know. Yeah, we I'm, took care of it. <laughs> that, uh, exactly. Well, we drew with the United States in our worst performance of the World Cup. Asterisk, yeah. we lost in the quarterfinals. <laughs>
Um, and this is this fascinating thing about Iran and Israel. And Israel now taking on the American mantle as the last great hope. A yeah. strong and emboldened Israel of values in dictatorships around the world, not just uh, in the region, is starting to get noticed in a way that it hasn't yeah. since 1948. Correct, yep. Yeah. I think it's also, it's a conflation of different things. You know, we have the situation with Russia and Ukraine, and that actually has brought in Iran, because as we know, the Iranian regime has been sending the suicide drones to Russia to use against Ukraine, further to that Ukrainian civilians in civilian areas. Um, and of course, that was part of the motivation uh, for the strikes that we saw on the drone manufacturing facility in Isfahan. It, of course, Israel supports the people of Iran, but in addition to that, uh, this is also a facility that's being used to wage war against civilians in the Western world, for lack of a better term, Ukraine. Uh, so I think that this was a huge uh, factor, and it also helped alleviate some of the pressure that Israel might have faced in the aftermath. Uh, because a lot of times Israel will do what's necessary, such as taking out Iranian, not Iranian, uh, Iraqi nuclear reactors or Syrian nuclear reactors in the past. And everyone says, oh, Israel, you shouldn't have done that. That was bad. Don't intervene. Don't. Inter There's going to be a war. There's going to be a war. But both times there wasn't a war. And, you know, behind closed doors, everyone says, oh, we're so thankful that Israel did yeah, that. Exactly. Yeah, they, they talk a good game, but Israel performs a good game. Yeah. Um, a few episodes ago, I spoke to an unbelievable woman who lives in London, who infiltrated the IRGC as a wife and a mother, and she lived there, and she's French Sephardi, but she didn't tell them, and her name's Catherine perez Shakdan, And she has an amazing story and insight about Iran, which you're adding to in this episode. Have you heard it? Yes, I have heard it. I know her, actually. Amazing, amazing person. I actually have an event with her today. <laughs> Do you? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Anyway, so we were having a conversation. They were asking many questions. And they asked me, like, you know, if you could ask for anything, what would you ask for? And I told them, well, obviously, I would love to sit down with Ayatollah Khamenei. Who wouldn't? And then they started laughing. And they told me, oh, fine, we could do it. And I was like, were well, you joking? And they were like, no, no, we could do it. We just need to ask, you know, we'll figure it out. Don't, don't worry. We might come call you and just be ready at a moment's notice and we'll tell you. Um, and on the, the very next day in the evening, they, I just received a phone call and tell me, be ready downstairs in 15 minutes. Phenomenal. We come to pick you up and they did. And, and I was, you know. So the Ayatollah Khamenei mm -hmm. sat down mm -hmm. with a Zionist yes. for 30 minutes. For 30 minutes. Got any photos? No, I don't. You're not allowed. No. No. So and my phone was taken from me. Um, you can't, you know, I mean, you know, obviously... That's a search. tremendous humiliation for him. Oh, they're paranoid. Yeah. So you can't, you can't shake his hands, obviously. No. Um, that's and not you, sniot. That's not no, uh, Jewish but that's, issue. He does, no. <laughs> but anyway, so we had, yeah, we had, we had, obviously, a translator because he doesn't speak English. Yes. Um, and... Does he speak French? No, he doesn't. So it's all Farsi. He speaks. Uh, he speaks Farsi, uh, Arabic, Arabic um, and I believe he speaks Turkish. Right. So this was a thirty-minute audience mm -hmm. with the Ayatollah, not allowed we were not to be alone, recorded, not allowed to be. People. No, you were surrounded by his yeah. team. You're not allowed to write down no. his notes, but you no. can memorize everything he said. Yes. What did you talk about? Uh, what did we talk about? Well, he gave me a run. We t he did a lot of the talking. Um, he gave me a rundown of you know the Islamic Republic's history and you know Ayatollah Khomeini. And um, he actually asked me if um, if I would like to write a book about you know his rise to power and you know the imprint that he had on on the on the Islamic Republic and the world. Go. So funny. We had a debate together on i twenty four news or something. That's how I met her. And, like, we were finishing each other's sentences. <laughs> That's lovely. She came on my show um, on Talk TV, and I had no idea oh, she has a what she story. was going to say. She didn't tell her life story there. She just talked about um, the Middle East. And then suddenly she said lots of very, very positive things about the Abraham Accords and Donald Trump. Yeah. And I said... He did well, didn't he? But you just don't hear very much on the media. Yeah. And she went, absolutely. I thought, oh, I've got a mate here. <laughs> so 
Oh, one more thing about that I wanted to add. Regarding the Iranian people, it's really important that the Jewish community globally and Israelis understand that the friend and Iranians, the friendship between Israel and Iran was actually longer than what's happened now with this uh, Islamic Republic. Historically, the Jews were always uh, an integral part of Iranian society, and uh, Iranians were always very philo-Semitic, and only recently that has changed. It's a natural alliance, and it always has been. So I think that uh, it's part of the motivation we see from Iranians who are so pro-Israel and pro-Jewish, and they want to have uh, this normalization and this mutually beneficial uh, relationship between Israel and Iran that they heard about uh, for my generation and that they knew about for the older generations in the past. And it's also important to remember that Iran was actually one of the first countries to recognize Israel actually before uh, the Arab states, and there was kind of like a rivalry between Iran and the Arab states, and they purposely... Uh, recognized Israel because they were afraid that some of the Arab states would recognize it before, and they wanted to be first. A poker game of recognition for Jewish people. Exactly. How about that? I didn't know that. (laughs) Now, I have a very good friend who, uh, another powerful female, it's not a theme of the uh, Johnny Gould's Jewish State podcast. Maybe it should be. It's just my luck. (laughs) Uh, That's good luck. (laughs) That's a good problem to have. Well, here's another one for you, uh, which is a friend of mine who's uh, a household name in terms of writing. She's been around for 40 years at the top of the game, uh, some people love her, some people don't love her. Uh, her name is Julie Birchill, and she is very pro-Israel in a Zionist way. Uh, she loves the Jewish religion, not so much the traditions, but certainly the Zionism. And uh, at the end of one of uh, Israel's perennial elections, she says the next day, hooray, we won. And she doesn't mean Netanyahu or Lapid or Bennett or anything like that. She just means, yes, democracy won. And this is the thing about Israel. If they're criticizing Israel for apartheid or anything else, it's hyper-democratic. A little bit too much. (laughs) (laughs) It is. Yeah, I mean, we have elections all the time, although now it seems like we have a a government for a bit. But things could change tomorrow. Things could change. You never know. Um, But yeah, I mean, I think she really has a point when it comes comes to the issues in Israel. There really is only one place that has free... Um, and fair democratic elections, and that is Israel. Unfortunately, uh, it's been that way for a while in the Middle East, and uh, I think we'll we'll continue to see that being the case, despite the fact that there's a lot of people who now, uh, as a result of the new government, are like, oh, Israel's democracy is under threat. Um, mm. That's not true. <laughs> Israel's democracy isn't under threat now. It's actually being reset and recharged, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. I think it, you know, Kinda even... needed it. Even if the even with the proposed policy reforms, there's there's over a hundred thousand people who came out to a protest, for example. So not getting into the actual issues of of what the policies are, just looking at the the reactions and the interaction in Israeli society. I don't know how you can say that Israeli democracy is under threat. I think it's they more don't vibrant than by, ever. Yeah, they don't get beaten by the secret police. No. Uh, they get a neged bus home. Yep, they're in before midnight. <laughs> yep, you know it's well it depends safe. on traffic. Yeah, As a Tel Aviv there's only resident. one road, isn't there? There's only one road up and down in Israel, isn't there? Um, no, there's not for people who uh, don't, don't take me literally. And we don't take camels. <laughs> no, well, no, no. It'd be quite useful in the south, though, wouldn't it? Um, it could be, yeah. There's that wide stretch. With how slow traffic goes sometimes, a camel might be faster. <laughs> and if you're uh, working this out and you've been to Israel, just imagine three o'clock on a Friday afternoon between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Yeah. What a nightmare. Yeah. What a terrible thing. Those roads aren't wide enough. No. Nope. They really aren't. On the subject of the two-state solution, uh, which has become... An easy topic, you know. Yeah, it's, really it's become... Conflict. It sounds brilliant to anyone who doesn't understand it. Sure. And then we have now a competing narrative, which is the Abraham Accords, uh, which uh, was masterminded by the Netanyahu government of the old days, by Trump and... People like Jason Greenblatt and Jared Kushner and Mike Pompeo and Len Khodorkovsky and all these characters up and down uh, who did amazing things and began to change the conversation uh, in the Middle East. So, Emily, two-state solution or Abraham Accords? I mean, I don't see them as conflicting. They're a bit conflicting, aren't they? No, I I really don't think so. I mean, I think the Abraham Accords ultimately helps pave a path to a, to a two-state solution. And we, if you look at, like, Trump's uh, proposed deal of the century, that was a two-state solution. And I think one of the things that was uh, interesting about that is that the right was ready to accept that, um, both inside of Israel and outside of Israel. And it was the Palestinians, again, who rejected that. 
And th this is the main challenge to the two-state solution and always has been, Palestinian rejectionism. Mm. The unfortunate reality for Israel is that if we don't have a two-state solution, then you are either in the long term, not immediately, but in the long term, you're not going to... You're not going to be able to maintain a Jewish majority, or you're going to have to have institutionally discriminatory laws, whatever you want to call them. People who don't like Israel will call it apartheid laws, um, but you can't you can't have a, a you can't have both. Uh, if Israel wants to annex those territories, it either means that all of those Palestinians will become citizens, and that we will ultimately, even if not today, lose a Jewish majority, which means we will also lose democracy. Or you have to have some sort of discrimination that doesn't give them equal rights. Now, because I oppose that, that's why I support a two-state solution, um, no matter what the cost will be in the long term. I also have to point out that when it comes to the one-state solution, or the many different versions of one-state solution that are being discussed, um, the security situation isn't really any better if you're talking about a one-state solution. You're still talking about living with uh, the Palestinian population, which has a problem with incitement, uh, has for decades, and we see it only getting worse. I mean, uh, where, you know, a Palestinian terrorist went and shot seven Jews who were leaving synagogue on Shabbat. Yeah, yeah. Um, the reactions in Palestinian society are shocking. They're shocking. The Palestinian ambassador uh, to the UK, actually, on an interview, refused to condemn it when he was asked repeatedly. Disgusting. He, he actually answered no when really the, the reporter held his feet to the fire. And even further than that, and you know, that's that's in English, that's to the Western world. But yeah. within Palestinian society, it's even worse. Yeah. I mean, Palestinian schools are celebrating, they're teaching their children, they're having them put on plays reenacting this terrorist attack. They have uh, ceremonies honoring the terrorists. And at the beginning, you know, you look at it and you see a picture or a video from it and you think, oh, that's terrible, but it's a minority. The thing is that this isn't happening in one place. This is happening in many, many, many schools all over the Palestinian territories, all throughout Gaza, in Ramallah, in Nablus, um, in uh, even a few Hebron. hundred yards from the Kotel in East Jerusalem. Yes, yeah, with incitement from you know from cradle to grave in Palestinian society, and you can't really have a lasting peace, whether it's one state, two states, or 27 states, until that issue is addressed. Now, I also want to preface my support for a two-state solution by saying that um, I'm not under the illusion that a two-state solution is going to be peaceful. I don't think any solution right now is going to be peaceful. The status quo isn't peaceful, as we see. The, uh, you know, a two-state solution isn't going to be peaceful, at least for a very long time, and neither is a one-state solution. So we don't have a lot of good options here. It's not like, oh, we need to uh, end occupation and everything will be great. That's not how it works. There was terrorism against the Jewish community before 67, before the the occupation of the you know disputed territories. There was terrorism before 1948. There's been terrorism against Jews throughout history, of course, as we know, but also in the land of Israel there has been. Uh, that's not going to change. And no matter what, what the solution to this conflict is, it's going to be very painful for both sides. Uh, the question is how do we minimize that and save and protect the most lives on both sides while also ensuring that in the long term Israel has a Jewish state in, in you know, our homeland. And therein lies the demographic challenge of trying to create a wider Israel, the, the fear that the Jewish majority would disappear and yet... We have a demographer in the name of Yoram Ettinger mm -hmm. who says, actually, the population of the Arab world in Judea and Samaria and Gaza is not that big. We haven't had an organized census in the Western way. And so the exaggerated numbers of the population uh, is something that has actually affected Israeli policy. When, in fact, we're not that much of a minority. They added 325,000 Arabs who have been away for over a year back in 1997 census, the number grew to 400,000 in 2005, according to the Palestinian Election uh, Commission. And the reason it grows is because their birth, birth among uh, those Arabs who are away for over a year. Today, it's over 500,000, which are not there but are counted as if they are there. You add to that the fact that the Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics does not recognize net emigration. Why? 
because that's how they decided to count it. From 1997, the first Palestinian census until the end of 2020, uh, we are talking about 350,000 Palestinian emigrants, which are counted as if they are inside the Palestinian Authority. And that's in addition to those who are away for over uh, a year. Uh, we're already talking close to million uh, artificial inflation. Uh, there are 350,000 uh, Arabs in uh, Jerusalem. All of them are considered Israeli Arabs. They're either Israeli citizens or permanent residents in Israel. But the Palestinian Authority claims that they are Palestinians and therefore 350,000 Jerusalem Arabs are doubly counted, once by the Palestinians, once by Israel. You already uh, are around 1.2 million artificial inflation. Should we spread our wings? I don't agree with those. You don't agree I with don't that? I don't agree with the statistics. There's a few different uh, figures who... Uh, are on the far right, I would say, politically. Although these days you don't know what's far right anymore, so we'll just say right. <laughs> yeah, I take out all the descriptions in my news bulletins. I produce a news bulletin uh, for the Gulf uh, in English because they like English. Mm, and yes. um, um, in the way that the Iranians like the French. Yes. Um, and so I do... This, but any description, like Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine, I might think it's brutal... But, but I'm you, not going to yeah, put it in. It. I'm not going to call Netanyahu's far-right government. I'm not going to call him Lula de Silva's hard-left government. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to call it Netanyahu's government, Lula de Silva's government. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm not going to uh, have the emoji in mind for one of those, which, are, which I'll keep to myself. But I'm going to, um, <laughs> but I'll just keep the language neutral. There is merit in your Ametinger's argument because actually there seems to be an orthodoxy about all this so much more of them than us. They think that, and that, uh, ha, that makes people fearful and causes an intransigence in policy. Yeah, I think that people are concerned about, obviously concerned about the demographics. And also when you're looking at like the birth rates, um, Israel is actually growing very, very fast uh, on par with the Arab world. But I also have looked into the statistics of Edinger, also Caroline Glick. And there are some really questionable uh, sources when it comes to these things. And even even if that was the case today, in 50 years, is that going to be the case? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, Israel is a constantly changing society, and I don't really want to risk the existence of a Jewish state on that. I much prefer to have a two-state solution. And furthermore, um, I don't have a problem with Palestinian self-determination. Whoever they were before, I know there's a whole debate over Palestinians didn't exist before. It's true. There wasn't a Palestinian people, and there was never a state of Palestine. That is true. At the same time, we can't deny the fact that today, there's a group of people who call themselves the Palestinians, and many of them want self-determination. I don't actually have a problem with that, as long as they accept the right of the Jewish state to exist, and furthermore, that they also stop treating Israel and Jews as if they are foreigners, because they're not foreigners. No. Jews are from Israel, from Judea and Samaria. So it's not unusual or foreign that, that Jews should be there. And it has been a policy, a strategic policy of the Palestinians from day one, to misrepresent the Jewish people as colonizers or uh, settlers who are taking over or stealing someone else's land, and in their perspective, Palestinians. This is simply not the case. It's not, and it's a, a, a very inconvenient truth that the majority of Jews in Israel are Sephardim and Mizrahim. Yes. And that's unhelpful to the deniers, that uh, we have more brown Jews than white Jews. Absolutely. That's not I helpful mean... for Mark Lamont Hill and all those other people. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think there's a perspective in the West because you have a majority Ashkenazi population in the United States yeah. and a big Jewish population in the United States comparatively to the rest of the world um, that a lot of people think Jews are white. And in some cases, people are using that in order to, to show that somehow Jews are not from the Middle East. But Jews are not white. <laughs> no. Even white passing Jews yeah. are not white. Yeah. Uh, they never have been. We've been killed because we're not. <laughs> yeah. You should so, see me on holiday. I catch the sun really fast. I do too. I'm a... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I catch the sun quicker than my uh, Mizrahi Safadi misses. Oh, really? Oh, yes. She catches up later. But, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. she has a, a darker starting point. So. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. 
now we're now we're going into a very very unpleasant you, territory you that we've been bullied for. <laughs> what do you mean? I want a tan. I wish I, I wish I you had, wish a tan. I had a tan. Yeah, yeah. What's Believe some... me, ten minutes at the beach in Tel Aviv, and I <laughs> I wish that I I wish that I had a tan because <laughs> what comes out is not a tan. It's a tomato. <laughs> it's a, yeah, it all goes red. And like uh, mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. That's what we say here. Um, Emily, this is a wonderfully upbeat conversation. You are a, a lovely couple, you and yourself, and you are modern-day Israel in the broadest sense of the word. Just give us a, a nice sunshine picture of the state of Israel as your final answer. A sunshine picture Give me of an Israel? optimist's view of the state of Israel over the next 50 years. Uh, ooh. <laughs> 20, <laughs> all right, second. 20 years. Well, I think, the fact that, I think the fact that uh, Israel has proven, and actually this isn't new if you think about it, but, but more recently it's been you know, covered because of the Abraham Accords, Israel has proven time and time again since 40, before 48 even and beyond uh, that they're committed to making peace with Arab neighbors and with countries that are supposed to be our enemies, even like Iran. And a lot of people will say, uh, will be skeptical about it. And, you know, I I don't know that people would have ever thought before the Abraham Accords that Israel would have not just a written peace agreement, but like the, the love between people. This is unprecedented. Even though we had peace with Egypt, even though we have peace with Jordan, um, the people-to-people -people interactions that we've seen as a result of the Abraham Accords are truly unprecedented. And we see a change. I've experienced it too in the UAE. Yeah. With it's a uh, change friendships in the which have grown. Yeah. Um, there is a kinship. It's so strange for me. Yeah, but, but amazing. I'm, I love it. <laughs> I'm from Birmingham, England, but I am a Jew, and their traditions are not dissimilar to mine. Yeah. So when they talk about business, and we're having a chat about business, at the end of each sentence, if they want to say, I really hope it works, they'll say, Inshallah. Right. You know, that's nice. I can't say that down the road here because they'll think, oh, you're mad with all your God talk. <laughs> But it's nice to say, God willing. Yeah, God willing, that'll work. Bezat Hashem. Yeah, exactly. Isn't that lovely? Yeah. And actually, a bit of Hashem is smiling upon me. Yes. Uh, because of that, <laughs> inshallah, hope. Yeah. Um, so, Emily, it's been, again, a lovely conversation. I do love um, coming around again and talking to people for a second time because you've warmed up already. We know each other a bit. <laughs> and uh, it's a real privilege because we... Uh, we can have a deeper conversation. Thank and you very much. Next time you have to have me and Catherine together, although you won't get a word in. Uh, we'll I, just I, I'm going, about it, I haven't got long enough battery power for that. <laughs> okay, it was great. Thank you so much for having it's me. It's a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny Gould's Jewish state is now stepping up to the plate. It's time for us as an audio provider to report Israel around the world with consistency and journalistic integrity. But I need your help. A one-off donation is always gratefully received, but a monthly donation really gets our service off the ground. To donate now, go to patreon.com slash Johnny Gould or paypal.me slash Jonathan L. Gould. Those addresses again, patreon.com slash Johnny Gould or paypal.me slash Jonathan L. Gould. Johnny Gould's Jewish State is brought to you with Dangor Education.